Article 1. See if now vote raise appropriate the sum of $2,700,000 by taxation, by transfer from available funds, by borrowing. How will that be, please? What's the motion? Borrowing. Borrowing. Okay. Uh, to construct a new senior center facility, including all costs and related 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 thereto, and that to meet the set appropriation, the treasurer with approval of the selectman is authorized to borrow the full amount of such appropriation under General Laws Chapter 44 or any other general or special law, and to issue bonds and notes, time and connection therewith. Further, any premium received by the town upon the sale of any bonds and notes approved by this vote, thus any premium applied to the payment of the cost of the issuance of such bonds and notes may be applied to the payment of costs approved by this vote in accordance with General Law Chapter 44. Section 20, thereby reducing by like amount the amount authorized to be borrowed to any such cost. Uh, provided, however, that the appropriation taken here under shall be expressly contingent upon approval by voters of a ballot question to exclude the amounts required to pay for the bond on notes issued here under from the provisions of Proposition 2 and a half, so called. Do I have a motion, please? May Dan Galant second. Mike? Um, this does require a two thirds vote. We have a Brief presentation. Mr. Green, where are you? Okay. There. Microphone so you'll be able to see it. I can't speak as fast as Ed, but I'll try to keep this a little brief. Uh, the building committee was, I'm Rick Green, by the way, a uh, farmer in town here, and uh, the chairman of the building committee, which we formed in. Um, end of 2015 and the basic idea was to oversee uh, the engineering process and so on and the building needs study, the first build it up there for the public safety built building. And also to, to utilize the $500,000 grant from Senator Brewer that was uh, given to the town to prop or to, to go towards the uh, senior center. So, the building needs study was completed. There's a report on that that's been uh, completed. And we also, we provided oversight for engineering design services for the senior center. Um, there's a host of engineers worked, that worked on the project from the well design, public, uh, public well, uh, site work, borings, et cetera. Complete design package um, that was put together so the goal is to come up with a, uh, a firm design and a firm price for the uh, citizens of Hubbardston. Uh, one of the complaints, the last go around, I believe, was that it was too, a little too vague and there wasn't any, sh certainly any firm price and a firm design. So we have that now. Uh, in May of 2017, we went out to bid and unfortunately due to the uh, bidding climate, there was only one bidder. Uh, and the price was too high. So we, we went, got back together and did some further cost reductions, a lot of little things, and put the project back out to bid. And this time in uh, September, there was seven bidders, uh, ranging from like 1.9 million to 2.5 million. So we had good competition, and we had some good, uh, good responsive bidders. So I will spend a couple more minutes just to talk about the senior center a little overview, uh, probably a lot of you have seen this. This is an aerial view taken from a hot air balloon last week while I was drinking coffee. That little red spot, uh, which you can't see, but yeah, maybe the red spot. Yep, there we are. That's about where it's, the Cedar Center is going to be across from Go Green Manufacturing and right near the Curtis Field, across from the Curtis Field. Next slide, please. This is a great slide, but let's try to see what we can see here. Um, Route 68 on the right side. Yeah. Okay, let's go to that one. That's perfect. There we are. There's the senior center fairly close to Route 68. Uh, north direction is there going towards Gardner A. And... Uh, so there's a 4,000 square foot building there with 41 parking spaces. Um, the driveway over to the left going horizontally is going to the future public safety building. And there is a public water supply well down further off to the left. 
Next slide. Uh, this is a little hard to see, but you have a, it's barely it's it's fairly uh, small center as centers go. Would be one of the smallest ones in the state, I believe. Um, the entranceway is at the curved entrance uh, curving up on the top of the entranceway. There's a vestibule. Um, it comes into a lobby, and the large building, a large room on the right, is a uh, you know multi-purpose room that's approximately. 34 by 38 feet. There's a commercial kitchen down at the lower right corner. There's office. Uh, there's a, a wellness room for uh, health screenings and so on. And there's a classroom and some bathrooms. And that's about it. That's that's where you are. About 4,000 feet right there. A little patio outside. Um, next slide. This is the entranceway. Okay, this is the entranceway. Uh, you know, nice, nice features inside the building. Well insulated, of course. Everything's to current standards, of course. The, uh, the building code is quite stringent on these kind of buildings as far as handicap access, um, construction details, bathrooms, etc. And there's the patio area. Uh, that's about it for an overview. Dan, do you want to add anything to this? Yeah, go ahead. Hi, I'm Dan Galanti, the uh, select board chair. I guess the only thing I would add is, um, you know, we understand the frustrations. I, I was also on the building committee, I should say that, for the last two years. It is, you know, um, uh, that the fact that we're here again. And I guess the way I would retort that would be to reiterate what Rick said. Uh, originally, which is we got this $500,000 given to us and we sort of rushed it as a town to put it out to bid the first time. And that was a mistake. And um, in doing that, I think we engendered a fair amount of um, angst against the project. But as we stepped back over the last year and a half with a very responsive and 40 some odd meetings and however else and spent that $500,000 that's not ours to come up with a formal design and then put it out to bid, find the disappointment of a single bid, come back out again and get seven bids, all less than that first bid. We feel as though, as a committee, or I feel as though as a committee, and I believe I speak for at least most of the other members, that we've done what we were charged to do. And that is, take this money that was given to us so generously, put it towards what it had to be put towards, and only towards what it, that was, which is the Senior Center project itself, um, and get the most competitive member at the most, you know, functional size we could. We started at 6,000 square feet, went to 5,000, went to 4,500, and ended up here, you know, hugging all, all along the way with, with, with many members. Um, but, you know, this is what we felt as though was most functional um, to fit into this community. So, that, that's it. Thanks, Dan. One of the questions that will come up is what is the cost impact to the average citizen? So that's going to be, it's up here. You can't read these, but depending on what type of uh, financing goes on, it, the co annual cost per average household probably will be uh, around $85, I would guess. So yeah, so there are a number of different options uh, as far as how long to borrow for. And, and again, that's another bone of contention, and I understand that as well. But so we evaluated 12, nine, some big number of options, and, and that still has not been selected yet. But the most logical ones uh, are called level debt options, which are just basically a certain um, a fixed cost per you know thousand uh, for a, a 20 or 30 year period. Were the ones that we came across, and based on our average town value of 250 some odd thousand dollars per household per house, uh, the average impact for those 20 to 30 years would be 85 to 100, or I'm not looking at it, but whatever it is behind me, uh, per that value house. So that's it. I think most of us came here tonight understanding how we wanted to vote on this. Are there any more questions or are we ready to vote? Laura? I have a question, 111 Hale Road, Alora Overstreet. What are the costs involved in maintaining and staffing this building once it opens? 
every year? How many more positions are needed in town? How much more manpower to maintain it? Dan? Hi. Uh, so you know, that's a question, obviously, we, we knew would come up. Um, as it has before, and it's it's a logical one, and you know, it's interesting on, on how to answer it. Um, so there's no question that there is uh, additional maintenance required. It's an additional building. The the early answer to that is that it would fall under the current guise of the DPW, which does have maintenance of, of the buildings within its you know purview. Now uh, it's difficult to say uh, exactly what sort of increase in manpower that would be for the DPW in their maintenance of it, and whether that be snow removal and filling the oil tank and, and all that other stuff. There would have to be some augmentation I can't answer specifically. But one thing I would like to say is over the last few years, we've really built up the pilot agreements we have in town with solar farms. These were revenue sources, um, significant ones that we didn't used to have. They're, they're 20, 40, 60, 80 thousand dollars per year of additional money coming in. That yeah, we can just throw in the coffers and say, yep, we got a new thing. But or we can also, you know, uh, think of it in a different way, which is we've now got these new revenue sources, which are also going to be coming in for 20 years. Um, per pilot agreement, that's how they go at a fixed amount. Why don't we earmark that for the functionality of a new facility? So I think that's the best I can answer here. So no additional staff to actually staff the facility? Well, I mean, council and aging, there will be an increase in hours and some of that. I'm not going to say that because we wouldn't, why would we want a facility if we were just going to, you know, not be in it? But, you know, our current senior center, uh, you know, uh, is staffed quite often. So, you know, as far as additional office time, you know, Rick showed you the slide there. I think there's one office and like another place to sit, but it's a bathroom, a, a function room, a screening room, a, a, a kitchen, and it's, it's not really set up to have staff. So it's, you know, it's more just the, 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 you know, constant aging and other seniors who are just contributing to the effort of, of having the facility. So one other question, um, because it affects the way I vote as well, is that there were three projects on the table. I know you're probably going to be coming back to us for the other two. What's the foreseeable range in asking for those other two? And if we've already got this debt exclusion on the table at this cost, Plus, every year, an extra two and a half to three percent increase in our regular taxes, and once you start piggybacking those projects, you're looking at a huge, huge cost amount here. Well, okay, so which other two? The PSF and the um, town hall possibility. Okay, uh, so PSF would be public safety facility, right? And town hall. So I, you know, I can't speak for everybody by any means, of course, but. Um, the reason uh, that things haven't gone further with the public safety building is because um, even though when the building needs study was done and the uh, interest level for a public safety facility was high, um, uh, higher than the senior center even, um, to because we did a town funded study on the costs of this public safety facility of which Rick and I and the remaining members of the building committee were part of. It was $25,000 authorized a couple of town meetings ago by the town. When we went through the many meetings with police, with fire, with the architects um, uh, regarding what you need to do to be in compliance with with terms I would never heard of that have to be related to holding cells and other things with a, a public safety facility, um, the costs were significantly higher, two to three times higher than the senior center itself. And so because that wasn't really our charge at the time, uh, we took the file that was given to us as far as a completed study and sort of put it on the side burner with no real discussion further after that. So I'm not going to say it's not going to be talked about in the future because there's the energy for it, but as far as, you know, um, how, how close we are to, you know, standing up in front of all of you with that presentation in mind. I, I, I wouldn't venture to guess, but I, I just, I, I can't imagine, um, you know, anytime soon. And then the town hall, honestly, you know, we've had more discussions about how to potentially move town municipal offices into the, a wing of the school that's empty versus building a new town hall. So that, that one I, I can't even um, entertain right now. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Your name, please. Uh, good evening. Kevin Maycumber, uh, 24 Mount Jeff. I got two questions, and I think I speak for a lot of the people here. We're really trying to wrap our heads around the $2.7 million. 
just from my experience, I head up engineering for my company. We built some of the largest infrastructures in the United States for IT. That said, my question to you is, did a professional estimator look at these bids that came in and to set it, put a set of eyes on these to find any places in these estimates where there could be cost overruns? As well, this is going to be a question to the attorney, what legal clawbacks do you have in that document to protect this community from us passing it tonight and then getting in, oh boy, we, got, we, we underestimated this, and we get hit with another $500 or million dollars that we are obliged, no way to get out, get out from underneath that. The other thing is... Can I answer that one first? Sure, go ahead. Okay, so uh, to that, so first off, I've been a professional estimator for 20 years in construction, Excellent. okay? Um, secondly, we have the most experienced senior center builder architect in, in the state or that does work exactly in King, New Hampshire, but that does work in Massachusetts over the last you know decade or whatever. Uh, and the owner's project manager that was working for the town with the architect is a professional estimator. So we had me look at it after the fact of two professional estimators looked at it in the first place. And when we got that first bid, that single bid in the round of May when it came in, and the single bid came in $600,000 higher than our Can estimates. we stay focused on the current costs, just stay not the past, but where we are right now. Sure. And so the reason that we rejected that bid was because we, as estimators, knew it was too high. And so we rejected the single bid, went back out to bid, went and, and, and revised and looked at all the different pieces and parts of the project, where we could cut, where we could cut, where we could cut, cut it down again, re-estimated it all, put it back out to bid, and it came in line with our estimates. I don't know if that answered my question. So you being a professional estimator, what probability do you say this current project will not go over budget? 70%, 80%, 90%? Yeah, 80%, 90%. You know, I think we can have a little contingency that's in that 2.7 million already because the bid that came in, the low bid currently, is in approximately 1.9 and change. Then there's site work on top of that and other things that our professional estimator that we hired for this, our owner's project manager, has added to that number. That is in the 2.55 range. This is an ask for 2.7 specifically to have contingency so that we don't have that situation come up. So uh, as far as the complexity of the design and the unknowns going into this, we've done boring logs. You haven't been in construction a long time. A lot of times you get in trouble when you don't do boring logs. You don't know what your soil conditions are. You don't know this and that. You get into the project, it's all change orders. All that's been done. I understand. My final question, Do, does this $2.7 million include all of the infrastructure costs all the way out to 68? Yes. All of it? All of it. Yes, sir. Your name, please. Uh, Glenn Gregory, uh, 11 Joy Lane. Uh, online, it, 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 the hubs in town forum, and, and many of um, the concerns, I believe, were, were certainly financial. Uh, we spoke back in. <clears throat> I'm sorry. The um, the concerns were mostly financial. <clears throat> so. It, I'd like to talk to you just the financial side of things, just briefly, and the, uh, the, the value for that. So it, we're, we're looking at something in the order of $22, $25 a quarter to the uh, increase of the, um, uh, the average real estate bill. Um, I know some folks would, if it's just $1 more, would, would not be for it. So I'm talking to the folks that are more on the fence. Um, Thank the financial committee for their recommendation to go ahead with with this um, with this building, um, and and all the work that the, the board has done to to get to this point. Uh, the, the value to the seniors, um, if, some of the cost is is just important to them, right? They're at the fixed income; they have the health care costs to deal with, and. Many of us here know the value of the senior center just to keep elders more active physically, uh, mentally. It just keeps you in the house longer. And again, you, you want to talk about personal costs, um, and nursing home costs, $1,000 a month. So we're, we're trying to avoid that by keeping folks both mentally and, and physically active through the senior center. Um, um, 
and I say senior center, and I want to draw a distinction that we use a senior center heavily booked during the day, but nights, not so much, weekends, not so much. So we're looking at this as a community center. And you get your, your, your parents or kids, their free time is mostly after school at night and, and weekends. So I, I think it, it's, a, it's a perfect uh, uh, mesh, if you will, to, to fully utilize this, this facility when it, when it comes about. Uh, and, and revenue sources we, we touched on earlier, uh, the, the, the solar farms uh, at, the, um, at the planning board the other night, a figure came up that we just, today's solar farms will generate $5 million for the next 20 years. Um, that, that more than pays for the senior center, not saying that all those monies would be allocated to that, but um, there is a, a vision, again, that I heard when I was at the FinCom meeting, that we have a, a community vision to step one, to the senior center. That may free up space in the uh, Slade building, possibly moving the town offices there. That would, step two, free up the library. So now the library being the sole occupants of that building now eligible for uh, a fair amount of state grants to improve that building and take care of their needs. Um, and I, again, I would myself would like to see a, a public safety building in the uh, in the future as well. So uh, that's my bit. I'm sure others will may talk to um, more the, the value or how we utilize the, the senior center today and the shortcomings. But um, thank you for your time. Thank you. Next, please. Sure. Does it turn down? Thanks. Thanks. Hi, my name is Alice Livedahl. We live on uh, 96 Mount Jefferson Road. And I just want to speak in favor of the project. My husband and I, can people hear me? Just closer. My husband and I uh, have only lived in Hubbardston about a year. We decided to retire here. It's a beautiful place to retire. One of the big concerns. I had when we moved here is, well, how long will we be able to stay here? Because there's not a lot of amenities for seniors in this town, it seemed to me. Um, and, you know, I speak from some experience. I think there are a lot of women like me that have spent more time caring for old people, their elderly parents, than they did raising their kids. Old age is a, is a real fact of life, and it's getting longer. And I did notice in the census figures in Hubbardston, only 6.4% of the people in this town are over 70. In Holden, next door, it's 10%. And the state average is 10%. So where are those older people going? There's not the, the community here to keep them here, I think. Um, and I think that, you know, there is a human side to this. If, you, if you're living alone on a fixed income, how much difference does it make if you can go to a place and have a hot meal with your friends versus having meals on wheels? How much difference to play games or go to parties or celebrate holidays, do crafts? These are important things in a senior's life. Um, and also a place for blood pressure checks and flu shots. You know, those are simple things, but they save lives. I think it's, um, there's a good staff here. I think there's already a good program in progress. I think you've got a site, you've got a design, you've got some seed money. This is a problem, it's not going to go away, and it's a need that's going to continue. So I'm hoping people will support it. Thank you. Next, sir. Uh, Mike Foley, Pitcherville Road. Um, I'd just like to ask if there is a reasonable assumption that if this is approved, that we will then be able to go for further grants to offset the final cost of the community slash senior center? Uh, no. <laughs> and I, I, I hate to say it like that, and I don't mean to say it with a smile, but we've talked a lot about how to, how to be able to get that. Um, what we have talked about and what we've talked about with, with the seniors, uh, they have uh, established nonprofit. Um, and they have established, which is our architect had spoken to them and has worked with them um, on what amenities, even kitchen equipment, big 
industrial kitchen equipment, could we leave out of what we've got and have them provide at a later date or other amenities inside? So there are alternate bid items that may or may not be awarded based on how to potentially fund those. But as far as grants availability, um, we didn't really find anything that, that was going to be possible. Okay, I hope to vote after this last comment, ma'am. Patty Weston, I live on 21 Adams Road. You have to talk a little closer. Uh, my name is Patty Weston, and I live at 21 Adams Road. I just had um, three things. Uh, a, a small increase in taxes on a fixed income of Social Security shouldn't be overlooked. Second point. A little closer to the microphone, Patty. How will the seniors get to this center. When we start getting older, how do we get there? We don't have any infrastructure for getting the people to the center. So the very center that they said, let's, let's do this, let's pay for this, let's dig in, let's do this, they can't get to it. And last, I don't know, I run a house and I don't buy stuff I can't afford, I save up for. It. So we got this solar power so why don't we just wait until we can pay for this? And then nobody's impacted. We take the finances that we gain from the solar power, you just sit on it until you can buy it. That's what people do when they own a house. You earmark funds. You say, okay, we want this. You, you have an eye on the future, and you say, this is where we want to go. How do we do it? I'm over here. How do we do that? If we live in a, in a house, we have to do it that way, or we're, we're in jail, or we're, we're in over our heads in debt. So how do we do, why can't we wait for solar power to pay for it? Okay. Is that a rhetorical question? It's a question. How, how, why can't we wait for solar power to pay for it? Yeah, I will. So um, I was... Uh, uh, we do have transportation for the seniors. It's a Mart van that we have, the Massachusetts Area Regional Transit, so we can go pick them up and bring them there and then take them back. The from reason... All I'm sorry, from all areas of Hubbardston? Yeah. Like I haven't seen it. Okay. Yeah. okay. So, so I guess that would be the first. The second is um, the solar uh, uh, money is nice, and I, I brought that up um, as far as answering a question to Rosemary regarding, you know, potentially offsetting some costs and operating it. What many, 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 many other communities have uh, is other sources of revenue besides property taxes. And that, that is how they save money, through commercial and, and, you know, that sort of thing. And so they can wait. For us, you know, we'll be waiting 18 years. So it, it doesn't seem to quite get there. So I guess that would be my answer to it, is that, that why it's presented this way here is because of the type of community we are. I guess I don't understand why five hundred thousand dollars is a lot of money. Why that can't just do it? Then you dropped your card. Thank you. Okay, I was hoping to move to a vote. Can we? Uh... I'm Larry Therian from uh, 63 Berry Road. Um, I'm on one of the boards. Last year, the small stipends we got were taken away, and it's fine. I don't. I don't need the money. But the point of the matter is, is if you can't pay your board members a small stipend and you're that taxed for revenue, how are you going to build millions of dollars on buildings that you can't afford? And you just said it now, it would take you 18 years just to take the money from the solar farms to meet that. But in the meantime, you're going to have other projects, you're going to have other issues, other crises that are all going to seep this money. We've seen the government at the highest level to the lowest level go into accounts that they have no business in. And so therefore, we're going to end up being in such debt that nobody's going to want to move into this town, number one. I am a senior citizen. I'm over 70 years old. And I'll be honest with you, I don't want to see my kids carrying a hefty uh, real estate tax because of a situation that we should never have gotten into, and that's building a new building. Be like me, putting on an extension on my house when I'm already mortgaged to the hilt. 
it doesn't make sense. Now, some people might say, I love living in debt. I'm not one of them. And I don't want to see Hubberston living in debt forever and ever and ever. And that's where we are today. Can you tell me that we can really afford this? Really afford it? If anything happens, will you say that you've got money to back you up? Have you, have you got any money in the bank that you honestly say we're, it's ours? We're, we're looking away from the thing. Do you no, want I'm, no, I'm not. I'm, I'm saying that we can't afford this. That's okay. what I'm saying. You, you've made your point. Okay. 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 Thank you very much. Next, sir. Go ahead. Can you turn the mic, pull, pull the mic up a little bit so you can cut right? Good evening. Hi. My name is John Nason. I am the chairman of the board of the Friends of the Hubbardston Senior Center. Close to the mic, please, John. Well, I'm 84 years old. I'm lucky to be standing up here in the first place. <laughs> You know, we're talking about a new senior center. I'm not going to benefit from, for that, from that uh, building for very long, quite frankly. Uh, and we're not doing this for ourselves, those in my age group. We're doing it for you people who are arguing against it, quite frankly. Now, where do I get my experience? I started out here in 2010 on the first senior center building committee appointed by the selectmen. We've been working on this for seven years. And I've been in every one of the committee's forms since then. The Building Needs Study Committee, the recent uh, uh, Senior Senate Building Committee. I went to the State House and spoke to Senate committees on land swap so we could get state land. The only, uh, when we put out an RFP, a request for proposals for five, uh, three acres of land, we only got one response, and that was the Crown Home property, which was 100 acres. They didn't want to break it down. So in looking at a map, I come originally from Clinton, where we had a lot of state land donated to the town for various reasons. Now, looking at the map, there's a lot of state land in Hubbardston, frankly. And when, when we went to the state house and asked for that, they said we don't give land to communities. We would, however, we'd swap. So we came up with Mile Road as a for instance, that wasn't good enough. And some swamp land uh, uh, down off of Barry Road, I believe it is. Uh, so we ended up with enough land to make a swap. And then with the good offices of Senator Brewer, he acquired for us almost $500,000 to develop that land for the senior center. There's been a lot of work put into this by seniors, by the way. We've been to the state house many times. What isn't generally known is in the last bond bill for the state, there was $1,500,000 put in there for the town of Hubbardston because we were trying to reduce the cost to taxpayers. Things changed in the state. Uh, they didn't get the revenue they thought it was, and I don't believe that's going to be a viable alternative, although I'm still tickling some reps and senators, but I don't see that as happening. But I just don't want you to think that we're out here looking for your money. The largest demographic in the town of Hubbardston is seniors, and it's growing. What are you going to do for those people? You know, now you're, you're, some of you, your husbands and wives are living fine together, but it doesn't happen that way. All of a sudden, one of them gets sick or passes away, and what do you do? Where do you go? Sit, your best friend is the television. That's not the case at the Hubbardson Senior Center. People love to come there because it's a family. You don't understand that the civic pride is at the Senior Center, and we need to develop that in this town. And I've been pushing to make it a Senior Community Center. That's what it should be. No buildings are being built in Massachusetts today for single use. It doesn't make sense. It's too expensive. You can see that. So what's wrong with having it as a Senior Center when the seniors aren't using it, and the lights would normally be out, that Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts and youth groups, mothers clubs, name it, could be using that center. Now, somebody's gonna say, well, you folks just came up with this idea. No, over two years ago, I gave the uh, then town administrator, Anita Scheipers, a list of fee structures, rules and regulations for the use uh, forms that would indicate that if you use that center and abuse it, you'd have to pay to make the repairs. So we've been thinking, 
I've been living this now for seven years. Thank you, Selectman. <laughs> uh, uh, but, you know, I don't see myself using this uh, for very, very many years. Let's be honest about it. If you see on the front of that brochure we put around, we said we're, we're not doing it for ourselves, we're doing it for you. I realize I was known in state service as the Fidel Castro of uh, the speaking service. So I'm going to be leaving. But I want to thank you for listening. Thank you for paying attention. Thank you, John. And please think of our seniors. Thank you. Mr. Ritchie. Thank you. I'm Vinny Ritchie. Uh, I think about this project, and to be honest with you, I don't believe I was completely decided until last June when Bonnie Cunningham addressed this group. And she brought me back to about 20 years ago when we had another interesting proposal for funding, and that was for our recreational field that we have. At that time, and Bonnie reminded us, that all the people who are supporting the senior center today were very much in favor of supporting the rec field back then, in spite of the fact that their children had grown up and left. 20 years ago, I had two children. I was in favor of the rec field. I think that particular beautiful place is one of the greatest assets that we have in town. I think Bonnie was right. She was right about a few things that evening, but she certainly was right about this. This is an asset that the town of Hubbardston is going to use, not only for the seniors, but for the community. But I'm also a taxpayer. And when I look at the figures up there from $85 to $105 annually, I say, wow, if I divide 105 by 12, that's nine bucks a month, thereabouts. But if I divide that by 30, it's 30 cents a day. I'll pay it. I hope we can see yourselves also ready to do so. Okay, we'll move to a vote, please. This requires a two-thirds vote, so I will need my, my counters that I asked for early in the meeting. You have a purple card. All in favor of Article 1 is read. Please hold your card up and keep it up until it's counted. All those opposed? You're not supposed to be over there, but yes.
abstentions are not votes as such, but I will count the abstentions. Do we have any abstentions? I don't see any. The vote is required is a, a two-thirds vote. The vote is 127 yes, 91 no. The article fails. Article 2. To see if the town will vote to raise and appropriate the sum of $60,000, notice that's down from $400, $60,000 by taxation, by transfer from available funds or any combination to be expended for infrastructure construction improvements to town roads pursuant to grant from Commonwealth Mass Department of Transportation complete streets, grant program so called provided, however, the appropriation taken here under shall be excessively continued upon receipt of the grant. Motion. May Dan, second Mike. What's the funding, please? Transfer. Okay. So if you note that the change was made from 400 to 60,000, I see no one at the mic for any questions. We'll move to a vote. All in favor, please raise your card. All opposed? Abstain. The motion carries. Article 3. I'm not going to read the cross house and things on this, but I'll read the, the text. To see if the town will vote pursuant to the provisions of General Law Chapter 4453E and a half, to authorize our new revolving fund account for fiscal year 18 called Hubbardson Special Events Fund revolving account as set forth below and to transfer any and all funds on deposit in the Hubbardson 250th anniversary revolving fund account and the Hubbardson Special Events Fund account, such as said Hubbardson 250th anniversary revolving fund shall be discontinued and to change the language of the authorization as follows. The new language is in bold and the deleted language is stricken. We have a motion. Made Mike, second Dan. Uh, if you see where it's stricken and you see the bold language below the stricken language, I don't see any questions or discussion. Uh, all in favor, please raise your card. Opposed? Abstain, motion carries. Article 4. Again, I'm not going to read uh, A and A, B, but uh, I'll read the first part of it. All earth removal operations in existence or which pre existed in Hobbiston on the effective date of this bylaw shall be subject to the requirements stated herein and according to the following. So this is a bylaw. It's not a zoning bylaw, so it's a simple majority. Uh, Mr. Ritchie, quick explanation for us? Yes, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. We need a motion, Mr. Ritchie. Uh, so moved. Okay, second. Mike, go ahead, Vin. Uh, Vin Ritchie, Chairman of the Hubbardson Planning Board. These articles, 4, 5, and 6, I have a report to read to you on. But basically, they're housekeeping articles, and in the interest of keeping it brief, I'd just like to say that nobody came to any of the hearings that we had on Articles 4, 5, and 6, and that the Planning Board recommends adoption of them. Thank you. I'll go back. Any other questions? Comments? Yes. Hi, Faye Zukowski, Ragged Hill Road. How many pre-existing uh, sand pits do we currently have in Hubbardston? Vin, do you have the answer to that? How many pre-existing sand and gravel pits do we have? Quick calculation. Quick calculation. Perhaps a dozen. Either. Yes, I'll stick with a dozen. Hello, I'm Laura Foley from 12 Pitcherville Road. I am no stranger to the sand pit issue in this town. I do have a question about this uh, pre-existing operations. This seems to uh, seek to establish a new law to affect things that happened in the past. And in some, I don't know how long in the past some of these sand pits have remained in the state that they are in. But it's concerning to me that this is a law, a retroactive law, 
to fix a problem that didn't exist a while ago, and I was wondering if the planning board could address that. Mr. Ritchie? Well, essentially, this whole question came up in 2010 when we revised the general bylaw. And at that time, we changed the bylaw on gravel removal for jurisdiction from the select board to the planning board with no particular reason except that we felt the planning board probably had more time and effort not only to uh, license but also to regulate. The wording existing was used at that point and it was felt that that would cover all of the particular sand and gravel operations in existence and the ones that were not being actively mined. Uh, unfortunately, it was brought to our attention that we probably should have included the ones that are not being mined, the ones that have been mined out, if you will, which still leave a blatant scar on the landscape, which causes all kinds of situations for erosion control, water, sedimentation, as well as noise factors for neighbors who don't want to hear the motorcycles and the dirt bikes and everything else in their backyard, as well as hazards from the very unsafe slopes that exist in the sand pits and gravel pits that have been virtually abandoned and are no longer mined. So therefore, the term existing is now going to be uh, combined, or I guess I say the term pre-existing would now be combined with the term existing, so that we encompass all of the particular parcels of land that are causing the nuisances in town. Okay. Second time? Yeah, I actually had a follow-up, but so what is the town's plan for these sand pits that are pre-existing and that virtually, as an owner of a sand pit, if you were, what is the interest in coming to Hubbardston to finish it if there's all these bylaws now to prevent you from even utilizing it? What is the town of Hubbardston going to do, going to do with all these sand pits? There's 12 now that are pre-existing. Nobody's okay, keeping. Uh, what, Mr. Ritchie, you want to answer? Uh, Mr. Bracco, you want to answer? Uh, I'll answer it. Okay. Uh, my name is Tom Bracco. I'm also on the planning board. Um, what we're doing, the planning board has been doing for the last almost two years, is we're going uh, pit by pit and asking these people to re uh, reclaim these pits. The, the existing pits have been, some of them have been mined out, and they did have an agreement with the town and uh, to reclaim these pits, and these owners have refused to do it. So this this came up in, in one of the gravel pits, and. Um, it's merely a, a, a clarification of what the law is saying, and we're just trying to clarify that. But we're actively trying to get all these gravel pits to be reclaimed. We're actively trying to get the pit owners to put solar voltaic systems in place, which will clean up the sites. They'll do the engineering. They'll do the work. And the town not only gets the pit uh, reclaimed, but we also will get uh, huge amounts of income from it. So this is just another tool, and it's actually more than anything else, it's a clarification so we don't have to spend thousands of dollars in legal fees proving that an existing gravel pit once existed. Did you, did you I, I'm not sure if I understood, did you say that the pre-existing gravel pits had agreements with the town? Yes, most of them did, yes. Okay. Kind of. So what revenue are we going to see from these sand pits that are abandoned? <laughs> Well, let me see. Let me see. One, uh, there's a gravel pit, uh, and I, we really can't, can't talk about people's proposals that haven't come forward yet. But we can talk about a proposal of 25 acres on Pitcherville Road for a solar farm up there. And they estimate that's going to bring $110,000 into the town every year. Okay, so if you multiply that by the uh, let me see, just the Marinelli pit is 100 acres, Don Norman Brown's pit's about 40 acres, uh, the Fletcher's are about 300 acres. The potential that we can build uh, uh, some really nice buildings in the future of this town. Okay, thank you. Mr. Ritchie? Uh, 
just one further point of clarification to this lady's comments was there is a comprehensive bylaw in existence that does regulate the gravel permits, whether they are actively mined, inactively mined, or potentially going to be mined. And the idea behind the change in the bylaw was to make sure that people just don't abscond with millions and millions of dollars and leave them abandoned and a danger to the community. Okay. I see no other uh, questions. So we are on Article 5. If you could hold your cards up. All in favor, please hold your card. I'm sorry, four. All in favor, please hold your card up. Opposed? You know, I, I think I'll be more comfortable counting. Could we count, please? On the side. It is, but there were some people that didn't have their cards up very high. Could, could you do it again now? All in favor, please hold your card up. Oh, okay. All opposed? Okay, the motion carries. Okay, if we could go back for a second to number three. Uh, the source for funding for number three is not available funds, but stabilization. I'm sorry, two. Two. Is uh, stabilization. To take it from stabilization, we need a two-thirds vote. We have the two-thirds vote, but I didn't count it. So if we could go back to two again. I'm sorry? Okay. I, I believe it was only four were against, but we need to record recorded. So this is number two with an amount of $60,000. All in favor, please? Opposed? One, two, three. No, it's the, I still have four votes against it, was which what we recorded the first time. Okay. Thank you very much. Motion passes again. Okay, so let's move on to Article 5, please. We have uh, some slightly different wording, so I'm going to ask Mr. Ritchie to read the wording. This is a planning board article, and uh, the language got changed a little bit as it, it went through from uh, proposal to final. So the motion will be as Mr. Ritchie reads it, if you would like to follow a couple changes. So this is on Article 5, and the motion is a cash security of $5,000 shall be deposited with the town of Hubbardston before the restoration. After 12 months, the director of public works shall inspect the site of disturbance to determine if there has been any settling of the whole. The director shall have the person or the company who did the restoration return to make the corrections, use the money on deposit to do the work properly, or return the money if there has been no settling or need for repair. Okay, so it's, it's fundamentally saying there are a couple uh, phrases taken out and it's only the cash options. Is that correct, Mr. Richard? Yes, and then also the deletion of the subjective wording of why okay. it's settled. Uh, do I have a second? Dan, second? Okay, are there any questions on the article? Okay, I see none. All in favor of Article 5, please hold up your card. Opposed? Five opposed, the motion carries. Article 6 requires a two-thirds vote. To see if the town will vote to amend the Hubbardson Zoning Bylaw Article 2 Definitions, Section 2.6, Aquifer Favorability Areas, as follows. The changes are in bold. Notice there is some striking as well. I'm going to read what it will finally be. Those areas shown on the Hubbardston map, aquifer map, as prepared by Places Associates 256 Great Road, Littleton, Mass, 01456, dated September 2017. Do I have a motion, please? Dan, second, Mike. Are there any questions on this? I see none. All in favor, please hold up the card. We do need two thirds. Opposed? One, two, three, four. Four opposed? Okay. Abstain? One abstention. So the motion carries. 
Yeah. It says it. Do you want it on there? Oh, okay. Early on. So there were, there were five votes opposed, so we, I declare a, uh, the two-thirds vote is successful. Article 7, Warrant Article for Evergreen Road Bridge Project. This is, uh, rather than read the article, I think I'm going to ask maybe Mike or Dan to give just a very brief explanation. It's a, a pretty simple, straightforward thing, uh, which the language doesn't make as clear as uh, a 60-second explanation will do. Oh. Motion, Mike, second, Dan. All right, so the real short answer on this is that the Mass DOT is actually repairing and replacing the Evergreen Road Bridge. Um, we as a town are responsible for getting all the necessary easements for that. Uh, all the land around that bridge is owned by uh, DCR, so we have to work with DCR to get the easements. Um, it's all really just housekeeping and legalese in the motion. It costs nothing to the town to, uh, to do any of this. It just allows us to, to get those easements so the state can do the work. Yes, sir. Hi, Matt Hopkinson. Matt, why don't you turn the mic up just a little. There you go. Matt Hopkinson, 34 Twin Hill Road. Um, I happen to be the project manager for the Mass DOT on this, on this bridge project. And it, it's just a funny thing. They, they took the road, and we've all been using that road. Um, it, uh, when they took the road, they never specified a width. So as the state organization that we are, we have to assume that it's, it's a zero width. Um, the DCR really isn't interested in owning a bridge, so I'm sure they're going to be willing to um, part with that land. Um, it's it, like he says; it's just it's just a housekeeping thing. Um, we do have to we do have to do a land swap for it, unfortunately. But but uh, there's no private land involved or anything else, so um, it'll be nice to get a new bridge. Thank you, Matt. Okay, I see no further discussion. All in favor, please hold up your card. Opposed? Abstain? One opposed. Uh, motion carries. Article 8 requires a two-thirds vote. Citizen petition to amend Hubbardson zoning bylaw. We, the citizens of Hubbardson, submit this petition and the following changes to the zoning bylaw regulating placement of large-scale industrial solar development. Uh, the old language is listed and uh, crossed. The new language proposed is 20.2.4, designated location. Ground mounted solar photovoltaic installations greater than or equal to 250 kilowatts DC are permitted only in commercial, industrial, or solar overlay districts. Ground mounted solar photovoltaic installations less than 250 kilowatts DC are permitted in all zoning districts in the town of Hubbardston. As of right, do I have a motion? Motion made, Dan. Second, Mike. Discussion. Mr. Richard. Uh, as, as required, I have a report on the hearings that we held on this issue. On October 18, 2017, the Hubbardson Planning Board held a hearing on a citizen's initiative petition to amend Hubbardson zoning bylaw. Article 20, use of large-scale solar photovoltaic installations, sections 2.2 definitions, subsection 20.2.4 designated location. Please see Article Warren Article 10 for the exact wording. The hearing was duly posted and published as required by law. Petition author Lisa Durant presented that she wrote the petition because of a potential large-scale installation being cited on land near to her home. She proposed in the petition that these facilities be located in the following zoning districts, commercial, industrial, or solar overlay districts. The petition also proposes that ground-mounted installations less than 250 kilowatt DC be permitted by right in all zoning districts in Hubbardston. The hearing was well attended and the subject thoroughly discussed. Testimony for both sides of the issue was heard. 
Those in favor of the proposal spoke to the point of not wanting a facility next to their home. They were not in favor of cutting trees for the facilities, were worried about real estate values of homes near facilities, and thought the facilities should be located in the commercial zoning district. Those opposed to the proposal spoke of the benefit of the large amount of revenue the town collects from the facilities and the loss of future revenue. Property owners have the right to cut their trees for any reason. If facilities were sited in the commercial zones, they would be visible to the entire town. Many residents who have been discussing solar facilities on their properties would not be able to have them built, even though they are in locations that would not be seen by neighbors. For instance, abandoned gravel pits, back land of remote lots. And because Hubbardston does not have an industrial district or a solar overlay district, restricting these facilities to the commercial district may be an over-regulation of solar and prohibited under state law. The planning board does not support this article and rec recommends that it not be adopted for the following reasons. The town would lose a huge amount of potential revenue. Cur currently, we receive approximately $105,000 annually with the facility under review scheduled to pay the town approximately $100,000 more each year. Moving these facilities to the commercial zone would expose them to the entire town. Adoption of this amendment has a high probability of being in violation of Mass General Law, Chapter 40A, Section 3, which states, quote, no zoning ordinance or bylaw shall prohibit or unreasonably regulate the installation of solar energy systems or the building of structures that facilitate the collection of solar energy, except where necessary to protect the public health, safety, or welfare, end quote. Since we do not have an industrial district zone, nor a solar overlay zoning district, restricting it to the commercial zones will likely result in the amendment being stricken down by the Attorney General. We currently have 33 uses allowed by right in the commercial zone. The commercial zone for solar would limit the land available for these other commercial uses. Present solar facilities have not resulted in large swaths of forest land being clear cut. To date, approximately 87 acres of trees have been cut. This constitutes approximately one third of 1% of our land mass. Siting these facilities in the commercial zone would eliminate the potential of siting them on abandoned gravel pits, which would help the pits be reclaimed and where they would not be seen. Currently, our zoning regulates solar facilities through the following zoning bylaws. Article 7, Special Permits. Article 8, Environmental and Community Impact Analysis. And Article 9, Site Plan Approval. These articles provide the town with the highest possible regulation under law. Allowing facilities of 250 kilowatt DC by right in all zoning districts in town would not solve the problem of keeping these out of sight. Theoretically, you could have a neighbor on each side of your property site a 250 kilowatt project which would take up at least an acre of land. There are many natural controls in town to the siting of these facilities. The location of substations that carry the power limits their locations state and open space land, the Watershed Protection Act, and North Slope topography, to name a few. The influence citizens have through the public hearings of the special permit process in the regulation and the siting. The hearing on this proposal brought to attention concerns about this bylaw that need to be addressed. The planning board committed at the hearing to work on these concerns, but feels that this proposal is not the solution to the problem nor is it in the best interests of the entire town. We therefore do not recommend its adoption. Thank you. Glenn? Yeah, most of the points we, we just made, so I'll keep this very brief. Um, the solar farms are bringing in some serious revenue to the town, uh, and obviously that's a good thing. It'd be <clears throat> funding other capital projects going forward. Um, <clears throat> The, the other concern, I think, by citizens, <coughs> excuse me, uh, w w possibly the insightliness of the solar farms um, and, and voicing those concerns. Right now, the, the, um, the, the planning board has a power through the special permit 
to pretty much write anything into this permit, uh, just to um, uh, re reflect the concerns of, of, of Mavis. So yeah, I would, uh, I would say that uh, we would want to leave this as is, is me, with my opinion. Again, for, for those two reasons, the, uh, the special permit gives us the, the power and two, it's a, it's a terrific revenue stream that frankly probably wouldn't come from any other industry. Thank you, Mike. Yes. Hi, my name is Cindy Schlenner and I live on Wil Williamsville Road with my husband and we are actually pursuing Borrego Solar, they are pursuing us. Uh, to put a solar farm on our property, and that's the one that they've been referencing to. Um, and I guess the big thing is that we've been through the process with the planning board and conservation committee, and it's been a long process. There's been a lot of questions, a lot of going back and forth, and they are looking out for you as far as making sure things are not unsightly. And I think as more time, more sites are available or um, people pursue uh, solar farms, more restrictions will be put on place to prevent unsightliness. But the big thing is, is that um, financially it is a windfall for the town. And one of the things we've been talking about is this senior center safety complex and the fact that you know, the town is struggling, and this is one way of getting money to support these without having to tax us. That's all. Thank you. Next. Hi, uh, Lisa Durant. I came up with a citizen's position, um, petition. We've had lots of discussion, lots of good discussion with the planning board. I have um, a comment and then a question. Much of what the planning board um, has said on numerous occasions is that the attorney general is going to probably strike this down if it does make it that far because they feel as if it would unreasonably restrict um, the ability to add large voltaic systems in our town. I will point out though that Mass General Law 40 does specifically state that it does not, it is not clear whether this law applies to the construction of large scale ground mounted solar systems. The language that the law is specific to is small and medium um, solar systems. So we don't know if the Attorney General will strike it or not. The concern and the issue is whether or not it's going to be in your backyard or my backyard or your neighbor's backyard. Um, I have a concern with property values. I don't like the language as of right in any resident or any district in the town, which is a concern for me. Um, and lastly, I would like the planning board to talk about whether or not they have considered or looked at overlay districts and what, what their thought process is moving forward, whether or not they would be interested in designated cert designating certain locations in town where we could put these large scale systems so nobody has to worry about it being in their backyard. So. Okay. Next, sir. Hi. Stephen, Han Stephen Hanley, Old Princeton Road. I just want to ask for a list of the citizens who wish to limit what I may do on my land so that they may pay the, ta the taxes on my land because they are effectively taking over my land. Oh, thank you. Hmm? Unfortunately, I didn't hear all of Lisa's questions, but I, I heard her question was for the, for the uh, planning board, have you looked at an overlay uh, possibility and or do you intend to in the future? We have committed at the hearing the other evening that we would look at and review the bylaw as it is written. We realize that there are certain faults that perhaps can be corrected and yes indeed an overlay district would be one of the items we would look at. Okay, thank you. Was there another um, Mr. Robinson, last of the question. Real quick, uh, this, this um, proposal would um, restrict any future solar system to the commercial district. And um, oftentimes we think of the commercial district as somewhere else. Well, it's not. It's right on Route 68 on the north side out of town. And I uh, just uh, drove up and down there today and counted what was there. There's 10 commercial establishments, two of them of which are multi-business establishments, and there's 24 residences. 
So while someone might not like it in their backyard, they're pushing it into someone else's backyard. Uh, the other thing is, I think the law as it exists gives the planning board sufficient control uh, over the placement, and I believe the people that are proponents of this are also interested in not having a uh, eyesore as such, and they are in the future they're uh, very much locating them out of sight in the backland uh, on the proper topography so it's sufficient as uh, Vince explained earlier today. Thank you. Okay, we do require a two-thirds vote, so if I could have my counters, please. All in favor of Article 8, please hold your card up. In favor of Article 8. Please hold your cards up. Vote is 30 yes, 128 no. The motion fails. If you could, before we leave, have a request tonight that if we can stack the red chairs seven high, but do not drag them, they scratch the floor, and the other folding chairs hang up at the back. Uh, having no further business, we stand adjourned. Thank you very much.